Um, good evening, everyone. This is uh, Code Pink's What the F is Going On in Latin America. This is a special edition this evening. Normally, we air every Wednesday at uh, noontime Eastern uh, for 20 minutes of hot news out of Latin America and the Caribbean. This evening, we're presenting to you um, a course on Sanctions 101 hoping to uh, get all of you to understand, all of you and more, to understand US unilateral uh, sanctions, how they're used and why they're used. So let me just give a, a brief introduction as to um, our guests. And also I should let you know that we're simulcasting tonight uh, with our co-hosts, Alliance for Global Justice, American Friends Service Committee, Center for Economic Policy and Research, Common Frontiers in Canada, International Action Center, International Committee for Peace, Justice and Dignity, Korea Peace Now, Task Force on the Americas, and several others. So um, thank you everyone for joining us. And let me introduce our guests. We're joined this evening by Dr. Key Park and Kevin Cashman. Dr. Park is a lecturer on global health and social medicine and director of the Korea Health Policy Project at Harvard Medical School. He also serves as director of the North Korea programs at the Korean American Medical Association and has led over 20 delegations to North Korea since 2007 to work alongside and collaborate with North Korean doctors in the DPRK. He is also a co-author of last fall's report, The Human Costs and Gendered Bias of U.S. Sanctions on North Korea. So welcome, Key. So good to see you again. Thanks, Terry. And, good to be here. And Kevin, Dr. Park's joining us from Park City, Utah, yeah? So, um, <laughs> and Kevin is here with me in Washington, D.C. Kevin Cashman is a senior associate at the Center for Economic Policy and Research, uh, some of you may as CEPR, commonly known here in Washington, DC, and has written on sanctions on Iran and Venezuela. Last year, CEPR produced the report, Economic Sanctions as Collective Punishment, the Case of Venezuela. So we have two, well, two gentlemen joining us this evening who have well researched the issue of sanctions and how they affect uh, populations within those countries who are sanctioned. There are 39 countries under sanctions affecting one third of the world's population right now. So let's start this evening with um, an introduction by Kevin of what sanctions are, what this tool is, this tool that many people refer to as uh, unilateral coercive measures or uh, unilateral economic sanctions that the United States unilaterally imposes um, on foreign countries. Let's start with that and then we'll talk specifically about uh, North Korea, Iran, Venezuela, and then we also will have uh, some conversation about how sanctions on countries are affecting the response to coronavirus, not only for specific populations, but for the global population. And then we'll open up the conversation to Q&A for all of you who um, are listening or watching. So Kevin, let's have you open for us, please. Sure. Um, so I'll just try to give a basic overview of uh, what sanctions are and uh, how they work and uh, how the U.S. talks about them generally. Um, so you mentioned they were universal uh, coercive economic or unilateral coercive economic measures. Um, and uh, that is very different, the unilateral part, than uh, something that the U.N. might do where uh, the Security Council has to vote on it, and uh, there has to be, you know, broad international agreement. Um, so that's one distinction that makes uh, this a little different. Um, but countries uh, in the modern age are uh, very dependent on one another. Um, very few countries produce uh, everything that they need um, for their economy, so they have to import goods. Um, this is especially important in countries that uh, have a very, um, uh, they don't have a diversified economy. So for example, Venezuela, uh, Iran, uh, both export a lot of oil. Um, so that means they don't, they might not produce all the food that they need, but they use uh, the money that they get from exporting oil to import food. 
Um, so these international connections are very important for every country, but especially countries that um, need to import goods. Uh, so the international economic system is, um, as probably a lot of people suspect on this webinar, um, uh, very influenced by US policy. So uh, the US government controls that structure uh, in ways that are very unique. And that's one of the takeaways I think that is very important for anybody listening um, to remember is that the US is uh, essentially the only country that can inflict uh, sanctions on country on other countries uh, without having buy-in from the rest of the world. Other countries just cannot do it. Um, and that's a function of how the US influences the international uh, economic system. Um, so they do that in a couple ways. Uh, there are, um, say you have a bank in uh, Iran and you have another bank in, uh, uh, let's say, um, Bolivia, and they want to uh, uh, basically send money back and forth to one another. Uh, they need to have um, essentially banks that are intermediaries and um, they're called correspondent banks. And uh, that system of correspondent banks make sure that every bank in the world is connected to one another. Um, and the apex of that system is uh, a bank in New York um, that's subject to US laws, that is uh, subject to US influence. Um, and so that's one part of how the international uh, structure uh, is uh, subject to US influence. Um, but they're also, uh, the payment systems, the actual infrastructure that was used, there are two predominant systems, uh, SWIFT and CHIPS. And um, SWIFT, for example, might be used between two European banks that never need to go through the US. Um, but if, if SWIFT actually has an agreement where it provides all information about transactions to the US government. So uh, you might have a situation where Germany wants to a bank in Germany wants to complete a transaction with the bank in Italy, and because it involves some sort of actor that the U.S. government doesn't like, uh, the U.S. government can basically threaten those banks and say, if you don't want to do, uh, you, if you want to complete this transaction, that's fine, but you might not be able to do business with any U.S. bank. Um, so because uh, a lot of these targeted countries, Iran, uh, Venezuela, Cuba, um, are uh, basically have a, a small percentage of uh, uh, other banks of business. These other banks don't want to do business with these countries or banks in these countries because it risks the rest of their business. Um, so that's a big incentive to banks and banks are very uh, cognizant of that and you might not even need to threaten them to get them to comply with what you want. Um, and uh, you know, one thing uh, the U.S. could do is provide letters to this bank, these banks to say, "Hey, you can do these kind of transactions if it involves medicine or uh, you know humanitarian aid." Um, but the U.S. government doesn't do that very often. Uh, so a lot of banks just rather not deal with these countries. Um, so that's a couple of ways where the U.S. influence on how the global economy works essentially cuts these countries off from trade. Uh, and when you have a, a president like Donald Trump that, uh, for example, ramped up um, uh, sanctions on Iran, you uh, uh, can cut off an entire economy from that system. Uh, so countries have to start trying to work around the system and uh, find ways, for example, to sell oil, uh, which they can then use to uh, import the goods that they need. Um, but even those sorts of systems, so Iran has been doing uh, a lot of business with China, for example, um, and that's sort of bilateral, but those relationships can still be uh, threatened by the US government. The State Department uh, sanctions um, uh, the captain of an oil tanker who is delivering oil to China. Um, and so uh, there are ways that the US can try to disrupt even bilateral trade that avoids the kind of uh, uh, structures I was talking about with SWIFT and uh, CHIPS. Um, so 
that's sort of the machinery behind how the U.S. can do this sort of thing. Uh, like I said, other countries can, don't have that ability. They might be able to prevent uh, transactions in their own country, but the U.S. can prevent transactions between third parties. Um, so that's a very important distinction. Um, but the U.S., I would just say that also uh, the justifications the U.S. use for this uh, it's been very revealing in um, the Trump administration to see uh, Trump himself say, uh, we're trying to punish uh, this economy. We're trying to um, basically uh, put pressure on the government because he's exactly right. The point is to cause suffering. The point is to cause civilian death um, and uh, basically put pressure on the government. Um, we know that it doesn't work. So we're basically, the US government, I should say, is basically uh, punishing civilians for uh, uh, preferred foreign policy goals. Um, so uh, that's, that's something that is uh, the collective punishment of uh, the population for these foreign policy goals. Um, and there are a lot of excuses that uh, somebody um, other people in the administration might use. They say sanctions are targeted or they say that uh, um, they don't exempt uh, or they exempt humanitarian aid. But when people try to take advantage of those exemptions, um, uh, they very rarely work because banks are too afraid to use them or the government says, uh, uh, we approve some humanitarian exemptions, but not these ones because these products might be used by the military or they might be used by somebody that we put on a, a targeted list or something like that. Um, and uh, another thing that uh, is important to keep in mind is even if there are humanitarian exemptions, if an economy is completely wrecked by sanctions, uh, a government might not even have the money to import humanitarian supplies. So if, uh, for example, somebody lost their job, then they can't pay to go to the doctor in the US. It's the same with Iran. If we tank Iran's economy, uh, even if there are humanitarian exemptions, Iran doesn't have the money to go and buy uh, masks. It doesn't have the money to go and, and buy medicine. Um, and so uh, there are various ways that these sanctions are rationalized. Um, Trump doesn't tend to rationalize them that way, which is very revealing, but others in his administration do. Um, but it sort of uh, shows you that these sanctions are designed to inflict pain. Um, and uh, that's because they're used to further US foreign policy. So uh, Kevin, I wonder if you can ex give us a few examples of this uh, individuals and organizations that are quote unquote sanctioned because my understanding is that's where it starts. And also, and that, but that's not how it plays out in reality, as you just explained, because of the international banking system and being able to participate, being able to participate in the global economy. Last week, I believe uh, Michelle Bachelet uh, said, uh, made a statement about the use of sanctions and used the term overcompliance by international fi financial institutions and that it was that over compliance of financial institutions that was causing the greatest harm. Sure, so the over compliance is um, sort of what I was saying about it. You know, if Iran is 5%, you know, max of your bank's business, then in 95% of your businesses with European or US banks, uh, why would you risk 95% of your business to do humanitarian transactions with Iran that might be uh, not subject to the sanctions, but you still might draw uh, the US government's attention to what you're doing. Um, so that sort of over compliance and unwillingness to want to even, you know, have any sort of business with these sanctioned countries is a is a big problem. Um, but like you said, there's also uh, this this uh, ever expanding list of people who are targeted by these sanctions and um, uh, you know, Pence or uh, Trump uh, or uh, other people in the administration will say, you know, these are bad people. They, you know, did X, Y, Z. Uh, you know, if you're sanctioning the Minister of Finance, uh, 
they have responsibilities to uh, sign off on transactions and that actually becomes a big problem uh, just to can do, uh, you know, ordinary transactions that uh, banks need to do. Um, so they try to explain it away and say, you know, we're sanctioning bad people. We have these humanitarian exemptions. Um, but the, the, the effect of that is that, um, you know, the, the humanitarian exemptions are almost never used or very uh, rarely used. And uh, uh, the list of people becomes so much so that uh, the government needs to find workarounds just to, to you know, complete ordinary business. So, Dr. Park, before we move to Korea, North Korea specifically, I want to just say one thing with you, Kevin, I, and the and the audience that um, need that people need to clearly understand is the dominance of the U.S. dollar, and that is a big factor in how the U.S. is able to control uh, what the banks do and what other countries do, but also. You've done that. You uh, and your organization created this report last year on on um, the, co the collective impact, collective punishment on Venezuela. And one thing I would just like to share with the audience to to explain how this works is that when I was there a couple years ago, and I go go about once a year, the government was trying to uh, purchase and import insulin for for its medical system. And they, I believe, if I'm if I'm incorrect, someone text me and, and correct me. Um, I believe the insulin at that time was being purchased from a German pharmaceutical company. The Venezuelan government places the order; it wires the money to the German bank. The German bank, in its overcompliance, says, "You know, no, we're not going to uh, transfer the payments to the pharmaceutical company because the product is going to Venezuela." So the pharmaceutical company doesn't get paid. It doesn't produce the insulin. There's no insulin shipped to Venezuela, nor does the bank repatriate the money that was sent to Venezuela or that was sent to the German bank. So it's really robbing financial resources from every direction. It's, it's really a grab of all forms of resources. And of course, the people that suffer were all the diabetes patients in Venezuela. So that is just one personal anecdote. Um, Dr. Park, you have many, many more specific um, examples you can share with us on North Korea. And so I invite you to join us. Let me... There you go. Oops. Okay, great. Oh, thank you. you. Uh, okay. Thank you, Terry, for organizing this uh, webinar. Uh, obviously, this is a topic that's very dear to my heart. We'll do what we'll, you know, Kevin gave a very nice overview of the sanctions, how it works. Uh, we'll do a little bit of a, a deep dive into uh, the, the North Korea situation. Um, we'll go down the rabbit hole a little bit. Little, little bit. So the, the, the sanctions started in earnest, the UN Security Council sanctions uh, in 2006. And this coincides with the North Korean uh, government's uh, nuclear program and in the, in, in, the, in the rocket program. And initially these were what we call smart, uh, smart sanctions, 2006 to 2016. And, and just a little bit of a backtrack, the, the world has been through this before where sanctions were creating all kinds of uh, humanitarian issues in the Iraqi situation. So there was a big push to make sure these sanctions were somewhat um, uh, targeted to, uh, so that it doesn't harm ordinary people. So these were called smart sanctions. And that's what was applied from 2006 to 2016. These target the military obviously uh, and, the, and the elite. But then the weapons program progressed and in, in November of 2016, right after the fourth uh, nuclear test, uh, the sanctions moved on to what we call sectoral sanctions. Uh, these are basically designed, uh, uh, these are very blunt instruments. These are not uh, uh, specifically targeting the military. Uh, things like uh, export industry, uh, blocking all export, uh, the main exports, uh, uh, coal, seafood, and textile. Um, really what, what they're trying to do uh, through these sanctions is to cut off all revenues, all foreign currencies uh, from coming into North Korea and thereby crippling their, their weapons program at least as their, their calculus. They also uh, limited uh, down to 10% of the previous levels importation of fuel, oil. Now you could imagine what that would do to an economy when you basically remove 90% of, of, of existing oil supply and down to 10% of previous year's levels. They also banned uh, importation of heavy machinery, 
industrial equipment, vehicles, and things like that. They also banned uh, joint ventures. It's basically at this point an economic uh, uh, embargo. Uh, they also voted to remove or expel all, all North Korean workers living uh, and working outside of North Korea by December of 2019. I'm sure you all saw some, some reports about that. So let's just go back to uh, what do we mean by a global sanctions regime? So this is the UN uh, uh, sanctions, Security Council sanctions, but Kevin alluded to the US unilateral sanctions. And it's really hard to separate the two because they work so well uh, hand in hand, at least for, for uh, serves the US foreign policy needs. So as you know, UN Security Council, the US has a veto power. So when, when, when the rockets were being fired, nuclear tests were being done, there was a fair amount of uh, consensus regarding, let's put some pressure on North Korea. So they passed these, these, uh, these sanctions uh, and that included Russia and China, right? Uh, they're, they're these, they have uh, their permanent members of the Security Council that have veto power. They agreed to it, but now the criteria that these countries have used to, to, to vote for these sanctions May, have, may be different now. So for instance, Russia and China may have thought, you know what, if they stop testing, then we should roll back these sanctions. But there's a thing called reverse veto, which means the US also has to agree to roll back on these sanctions. So even though the other members of the Security Council may say it's time to roll back the sanctions, it only takes one country, namely US, to say we're not rolling back until they meet our expectations, our foreign policy objectives. So here's, this, this is where U.S. has really uh, commandeered and co-opted the, uh, the Security Council for their foreign policy. And we also, and Kevin talked about the Office of Foreign Assets and Con uh, Control. The U.S. banking system is under control of U.S. Treasury, and then U.S. banking system is int integrated into the global financial system. And they have passed executive orders where basically, it's, you know, it, it, it takes, it, 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 this is how it reads, uh, a foreign financial institution which has knowingly conducted or facilitated significant trade with North Korea uh, may lose its ability to maintain a correspondent bank in the US, US right? It's basically saying if you uh, facilitate a transaction with the ultimate beneficiary of, of products going into North Korea, you could be removed from the SWIFT system, which is a kiss of death for a bank. So no bank wants to, uh, to, to, to do, uh, deal with these things. And I'll give you a specific example uh, a little bit later. I wanna talk a little bit about the humanitarian impact because the title of this webinar is Sanctions Kill. And I really wanna dive into this, this, this issue. These sanctions harm the, the weakest and the most marginalized people of, of, of other countries, but specifically North Korea. We're dealing with a, we're dealing with a population which is already 40% uh, food insecure one out of five child, children are stunted, and then they have one of the highest tuberculosis burdens in the world. So humanitarian organizations are in there trying to help uh, the most, uh, the, the people that have fallen behind, right? People that are most uh, vulnerable. Here's what's, what's happened. UN agencies are already there. They publish annual reports saying these are the urgent needs uh, for let's say 2018 uh, for food, uh, basic medical needs and clean water. Well, unfortunately, they requested $111 million, but because of the pressure against the donors, only 24% ended up being funded. Um, so th this is a big issue. And plus, on top of that, they not, not only are these humanitarian agencies are not getting funded to do their programming, their operational capabilities are degraded. And we talked about um, the banking channel. And I'll, get, I'll give you an example. There is a one UN agency, which I, 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 I was in North, North Korea in November last year, and the North Korean government said, this organization is one point over a million dollars behind on their bills, uh, which is their rent, you know, fuel, uh, electricity, things that you know, they need to keep their office open in Pyongyang. It turns out that this organization used to get cash out from a bank, uh, an outside of a bank, and then bring the cash into the country. When in fact, this is how all the other organizations do it. They hand carry cash into the, not the country to pay for their expenses. Well, the bank that was actually given this cash asked, what is, where's is this money going for? And of course, the, agency, the UN agency, they're gonna say it's going into North Korea to support our operational expenses. Well, the bank de-risked themselves and said, no, we can't release money. If we, we know, we know it's going to go to, to, to North Korea. This is legitimate UN agency operational expenses and banks are refu refusing to uh, uh, com uh, tr uh, facilitate these transactions. It's, it's one a clear example. Now, 
my group at, at, at Harvard Medical School, we actually did a research project last summer looking specifically at the human cost. We asked ourselves, is there a way to estimate how many people might have died as a result of the, uh, the, 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 the sanctions and the funding cuts uh, for the humanitarian aid organizations in, in North Korea? And it turns out that we can, uh, specifically the UN agencies, they publish each year uh, what they're intending to do and what they were able to achieve the very next year. And you can see the gap in their programming uh, achievements. And we came up with an estimate, at least for 2018, almost 4,000 people we think have di died as a result of the sanctions and the funding uh, shortcuts for their programming. And most of them, 3,200, are children under five. And this also includes over 70 pregnant women who, aren't, who were not able to get emergency reproductive kits that they could have used if when they had complications during pregnant, uh, when they were delivering children. And I want to talk a little bit about the gendered impact. We know sanctions degrade women's economic status and threaten the social rights. And we know that in, in the market trade, the sanctions are designed to reduce market trading. This is primarily a female occupation. We just talked about how um, maternal health is directly impacted by uh, absence of these emergency reproductive kits. And then we talked about also the fuel and importation of heavy equipment. Women are the primary gatherers of clean water, water in, in, in rural areas. So they now have to walk to f uh, further distances to get, get water. And farming, all mechanized farming require fuel. Well, if you don't have fuel, then you have to go back to doing farming the old fashioned way, which is physical labor. So these things have direct impact on, 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 on women disproportionately uh, on, on the women of North Korea. So I get asked about, well, Dr. Park, what have you actually seen inside North Korea as a result of these sanctions? So I've, I've been going in since 2007. I'm a surgeon. I actually operate inside the ORs uh, in Pyongyang primarily. And they, you know, just give you an idea, it's a low resource country uh, and, they're scared, they're, and they have been socialized for scarcity. For instance, uh, I'm given uh, a scalpel. Uh, typically, you know, we get fresh scalpel every time we do a new case. Uh, I get rusty scalpel because they want to use it till it can't be used anymore. So these are the kind of th the things that we experience and they use just about, reuse just about everything until it becomes unusable. The sanctions, don't forget it, in, not, not only does it in, impede humanitarian organizations from uh, being able to deliver assistance to North Korea, but it also hinders the North Korean government's effort to, let's say, repair their hospital equipment, uh, medical equipment, they can't import. So there was an X-ray uh, machine uh, that was in the operating room for since 2007. We were able to use it every year. If it breaks, they were able to get parts and we can use it. Well, just a year and a half ago, uh, the machine was broken. So I asked uh, the, 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 the surgeons there, what happened? They said, we can't get parts. And so they walked me through the whole process. They said, well, we, we don't have foreign currency, number one, to be able to purchase it. We don't even, if we, even if you uh, found the vendor, that's willing to sell us a, 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 a part to a North Korean entity, which is, which may, these days is hard to do. Uh, you can't send the money out over there. And plus the Chinese uh, 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 customs will block it at the border because anything with metal, they have to stop and then report. You see what, so you can see clearly the kind of uh, challenges the North Korean health system and the doctors that, you know, that, that care for the patients uh, are experiencing. I want to do a little bit of a, 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 a just talk about the COVID-19 situation. This has been an interesting development. You know, North Korea, when, when, when the Chinese, the, uh, there was an, an epidemic I, I located in, in Wuhan, they saw what was happening and they were finding patients moving closer and closer to the Chinese North Korea border. They immediately sealed off all their entry points and then stopped the, 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 uh, the tourism immediately and then subsequently stopped all trade with China. So the, the, the border is completely sealed. This is, has, this has a, a huge cost, uh, economic uh, implications for North Korean economy. They rely, their main trading partner is, is China. Obviously the, the, the tourism also brings in uh, foreign currency. They stopped it because they were afraid of having the virus enter into their country. They asked for help. They actually went and, and officially uh, asked for help with the international organizations for, to get ready uh, with diagnostic equipment, and, 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 and uh, supplies to treat patients. Because if there's a surge of patients, which I think they will eventually have, they're not keep, they're not, they don't have the capacity to deal with 
massive numbers, maybe just a handful, but the massive numbers will overwhelm the system. So the, the UN Security Council, this, uh, the, uh, the North Korea Sanctions Committee and the US State Department actually made press releases. Uh, to me, it was unprecedented, showing solidarity with North Korean people, saying we're concerned about the North Korean people uh, uh, when it comes to uh, 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 the COVID-19 threat. But what they did was, they still said, we're willing to facilitate expeditiously all the exemption requests that needs to, that the, for, for, uh, for supplying assistance to North Korea. And, and herein lies the problem, right? You, you, I give an analogy. Let's say I see a patient on the street, he's got an injury, he's bleeding to death. I should go there and stop the bleeding and try to you know, uh, do whatever surgery or whatever like that. For me to, if I had to stop and then say, wait, I have to check with somebody if I can do this or not. That makes no sense, but that's exactly what's happening. Is that the, the sanctions regime is not, it has, has, has a humanitarian exemption clause. That is completely absurd. It, it's, and, and the COVID situation, a COVID-19 situation has, has really put a spotlight on the absurdity of the UN Security Council regime. You know, the whole idea of having to ask for permission on a case-by-case -case basis in the setting of international health emergencies. It doesn't make it sense anymore. So I just wanna finish off with saying that sanctions are, uh, shackling the ability of humanitarian organizations to deliver aid to North Korea, even though they explicitly state that they're not intended to do so. As a result, innocent people, many children and, and women have died in North Korea, at least in our estimation. And then this COVID-19 situation clearly exposes the inhumane nature of this uh, sanctions regime when it comes to uh, 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 humanitarian conditions. And I think we need to talk about now, you know, can we come up with an accountability mechanism uh, when applying sanctions so that we don't, we don't have any further in the future uh, 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 loss of innocent uh, human lives. So I'll stop there. Sorry, I need to unmute myself. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Park. I wonder, Kevin, if you could pick up um, with the humanitarian issues, particularly regarding healthcare systems and medicine um, in Iran and Venezuela. And I will say, I just saw a message that um, in Venezuela, President Maduro has just called for a national quarantine. So maybe Kevin, with your uh, research on Iran and Venezuela, we could specifically look at probably Iran right now, but also Venezuela because they're moving in a similar direction. How, um, how these nations are not able, is that, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah okay, it sounds warbly on my end, I'm sorry. Um, if we, we could discuss the, the healthcare system in Iran and potentially Venezuela as well now and how they, they will or will not be able to respond. No, it's very garbled. No, it's almost like it's reverberating. So, Okay, do you want to try again? Sure, can you hear me now? Okay, that's much better. Yeah, okay. thank you. Yeah, much better. Thank you. Um, so, as I, I said before, um, Iran and Venezuela's economies are both very dependent on oil production and exportation. Um, so, uh, when you see uh, the Trump sanctions against uh, Venezuela or the Trump sanctions against um, Iran, um, you, can, you can see that in the oil production data very clearly. Um, you can calculate how much money and uh, how much uh, foreign exchange these economies are uh, missing out on um, because of uh, the sanctions. 
Um, so uh, what my colleague at CEPR did last um, uh, year with Jeffrey Sachs was um, uh, try to quantify that and then look at surveys about mortality. Um, and you can see that uh, uh, I think three Venezuelan universities conducted a survey and found uh, uh, during the period of increased sanctions, there was about 40,000 deaths, excess deaths. So um, this is from not getting cancer medication. This is uh, from not getting um, medication to treat HIV. Uh, it's from not getting basic supplies. Uh, it's from all sorts of things. Um, and it's a very rough estimate, but um, you know, based on what's happening in Venezuela and how the sanctions have worked out, uh, we can expect that to in increase um, or have increased since that period. Um, and it's the same thing with Iran. Iran has a, a more diversified economy. Um, and uh, so uh, it's a little bit more insulated from the sorts of things that Venezuela has been subjected to. Um, but it's still the same story. Uh, if you talk to doctors there, there's been some news reports about uh, um, that have featured Iranian doctors. They talk about not having supplies. They can't treat people in cancer wards. Um, and this is because we, you know, there are only so many medications that uh, a person with a specific type of cancer can get that are effective. Um, and it's, uh, you know, there aren't, you know, the Iranian economy can't just generate a substitute. It can't, uh, you know, do that so quickly. Um, and if it did, it would be very expensive. Um, so that's sort of how these two countries have been affected by um, those sanctions. And, and it's important to note that it's always the most vulnerable that are hurt the most um, and that there are different effects on women, on men. Um, obviously, people who are very sick uh, probably are hurt more than the, the main population. Um, but uh, Iran also saw food shortages. So um, there are a lot of effects on the economy. Um, these two countries, it's, it's more easy to see than in uh, countries that aren't reliant on uh, oil as much as an export. Um, but, you know, with the, the coronavirus, I think that it's going to get much worse for these countries and there are going to be many more deaths. Um, and uh, both countries have, have traded with China and Russia bilaterally um, to sell oil. And uh, I know that both of them, those players are going to be very important to uh, them getting the relief that they need. Um, I believe China has delivered supplies to Iran um, and uh, medical teams. Uh, so um, it looks like Trump won't uh, remove the sanctions on Iran even during this critical period. So that's sort of the, the, the mechanism by which they're going to need to get help. Um, but um, I also think that, you know, it's this is a, a very... Uh, a unique moment and there's going to be a lot of suffering uh, but it's important to emphasize that this is a crime all the time these sanctions are illegal um, in various ways uh, by international law and um, the u.s government is can get away with it but we need to remember that this is an ongoing crime So thank you for mentioning that sanctions are an ongoing crime. I think this is one of the, the biggest educational hurdles we have here in the United States as a population is getting citizens to understand sanctions as warfare. It is not conventional warfare, so it is not something that has to necessarily go through Congress. A lot of um, sanctions are introduced on countries through the White House, through executive order in response to national emergencies. And I would um, just let all of you know that in regard to that, Ilhan, that specific form of sanctioning as a national emergency from the executive office, um, Ilhan Omar has introduced a bill uh, February 12, I believe, um, to revise how the executive office can implement sanctions in response to national emergencies. And she has uh, included in that bill our um, sunset uh, regulations. So as Dr. Park, as you had mentioned that perhaps they, which is not being seen in the UN Security Council that when the sanctions, to measure the sanctions and what they're achieving and then to uh, gradually retract them as um, conditions 
improve. So it's not a complete overhaul of US foreign policy, but it is an attempt, it's a start. And it's, uh, so I would encourage all of you to uh, visit her, um, her website and take a look at that legislation that she's introduced because it is a first step, particularly for those of us who do work here on the Hill in Washington, it is a first step for us to really openly talk about sanctions as as a form of warfare. It's very important that people understand, and I think both of you have given really clear, uh, very clear pictures of what's happening to the general population. So many of us here in the States feel that, again, as we had opened with, we're not dropping bombs on these countries. We don't have boots on the ground. How can it be? And it's because we're still thinking in terms of conventional warfare versus new forms or hybrid forms of warfare, economic warfare, cyber attacks, those sort of things. I wonder as we've um, been talking about how the sanctions are affecting general populations in grotesquely high numbers and the inability to provide health care, can we have a brief conversation as to how different countries are actually responding? We are seeing certain countries like China uh, mobilize at a very, you know, the complete government and complete population versus the privatized system we have here in the United States where communities are figuring it out community by community, city by city, state by state. So can we have a brief conversation about the benefits of a certain of, of a very strong government-led reaction to coronavirus, particularly those countries under sanction, versus how we're seeing um, the United States respond. Does anybody want to jump in on that? Well, well I, I just wanted to mention just something. Uh, 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 so, you know, the, the current sanctions require humanitarian exemptions, of, of approval at the, uh, the uh, 1718 committee. And um, this COVID-19 uh, situation, uh, there's, there's one clear example where the one country has flouted the sanctions. This is uh, unprecedented. It's Russia. Uh, they just said, we're gonna send 1500 diagnostic kits. And so I have some contacts at the Security Council, the, the sanctions committee. Hey, did the Russians get an exemption for this? And, then, and I was told no, and they sent it in. And so, what they're saying is, uh, listen, go ahead and you know try to crack down on this. It, it makes no sense, right? Uh, who's going to stop uh, uh, trying to send in the diagnostic kits for, for COVID-19? And I'm pretty sure the Chinese are, are also providing assistance, uh, and, and they're not telling, and they're not getting uh, upfront approval at the sanctions committee. So here's some examples where uh, some countries are actually flouting sanctions. So Kevin, is there anything you want to add? Yeah, I would just say that, um, you know, I think China has uh, specifically said that this is an international problem and that, you know, countries need to work together instead of, uh, you know, trying to handle this alone or, um, you know, blaming other countries or what have you. And I think that uh, that might be behind some of uh, how they've approached aid. Um, Italy requested aid from the European Union, and this is, you know, these are countries that are in a, a, a confederation together um, and it didn't receive a response. It received a response from China. Um, so China, uh, I think in times like these and in times when, uh, you know, countries like Iran or, or Venezuela are under uh, sanctions has been important because it has a very big economy. It manufactures a lot of stuff. Um, it can have the power to confront the United States, although it's very, uh, um, you know, usually very diplomatic when it does so. Uh, and that's, it's a very important counterweight to these, these sanctions. Uh, the U.S. government, I think, could, could you know, following what it's done to uh, uh, banks in, in Venezuela or Iran, it could um, uh, shut down or, or put a lot of Chinese banks on its uh, um, sanctions list, but it hasn't because I think uh, China is too important to the uni United States and too important to the global economy. Um, and that's a, a very good uh, development um, for countries like Iran or Venezuela or any, any country that uh, needs help like Italy.
So one of the things I want to mention that as we're talking about um, the use of sanctions and the fact that they don't work is that right here in our own hemisphere, the nation of Cuba has been sanctioned, embargoed, and now full-blown blockaded by the United States since 1961. And there has been no change of government on Cuba. The Cuban people are extraordinarily resilient in how they're responding um, for the last 60 years in developing. They're very resourceful and um, have not changed their government. So it's right here, not far from where Kevin and I live, there is no regime change for 60 years. And so this is a system and a form of warfare, a form of regime change, US influence that just simply doesn't work. Um, also, I don't know how many of our listeners know that also here in our hemisphere, Nicaragua has been, um, ex sanctions have been, ex financial sanctions have been expanded on Nicaragua as of last Thursday. That was done um, in Congress on a verbal vote an oral vote that was done very quietly and passed unanimously. So this is really an outright form of regime change, foreign policy, economic warfare. I wonder um, if either one of you have any specific examples you could add to that. And I think we have a few questions too. So hold on. This one is for Dr. Park. If you could give a few more examples as to your personal experience performing surgery in North Korea. Let you see the difficulties. Sure. Um, uh, it, it, it all boils down to a, a country that's struggling with low resources. And the, uh, as far as the number of uh, doctors, surgeons, uh, anesthesiologists, nurses, and things like that, they have actually have a, an army of, of, of healthcare workforce, and, and they're on the government payroll. Um, the problem is that they, they, the things that are costly, you know, consumables, uh, these, this is where they struggle. Um, and, and, and despite that, the North Koreans are super, uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They're, 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 they're innovative <laughs> and creative, and they, 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 they're now really digging in uh, to this uh, sanctions regime. They're not hoping for a, a, a sanctions rollback. Um, so the, one of the things that I've seen North Koreans uh, do is uh, develop their own uh, medical devices. So uh, I have seen a, a North Korean artificial knee joint that they have developed and they're now implanting it on their own patients. Also for spine surgery, they're, 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 they have developed and they're using uh, uh, screws. They, they have also uh, manufactured their own uh, ultrasound machines for domestic consumption, patient monitors and things like that. So I think what they're doing is now uh, uh, developing their own technology so they don't have to be dependent on, on external resources. But there are a few things that they just, they just can't develop like chemotherapeutic agents and uh, uh, some of the very high, high, highly technical things. Um, they, they would, that, that, that's something that they couldn't, um, I mean, the, the number of people that would benefit from that is small anyway, so the investment would be would be there. So, so yeah, the, the North Koreans are trying to become self uh, self reliant uh, and then become sanctions resistant, if you will. Uh, but having said that, you know, it, it, it's a difficult time for them, right? It, it, these uh, uh, these sanctions are impacting the the, the hospitals from so they, the, the machine still remains broken. Uh, it makes things much more harder to operate. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, you know, these, these are some of the things that I've seen and, and, and it's unfortunate. You know, listening to you reminds me of um, one of my visits to Venezuela right after sanctions had been, I think maybe 2000, early 2018 and the sanctions were expanded quite strongly in August of 17. And one of the people I was traveling with said, you know, at some point the United States is gonna sanction itself into obsolescence and listening to you talk about the resiliency of the North Korean people and how they're developing, uh, diversifying their own economy to provide their own resources. We see the same in Cuba, um, Iran too, I believe, Kevin, although a number of their domestic industries have been sanctioned as well. And so it's really an interesting thing to see that as, as 
the sanctions get more pronounced and tighter and tighter on more and more countries, it's leaving other countries no alternative but to find solutions outside of the United States. And so um, currency and everything. And so I wonder how both of you feel about that. Right, right. so these are the unintended consequences of sanctions, sort of the other perspective, right, uh, on the US. Uh, there may end up being a, a separate banking channel that excludes the US dollar. You know, because they, 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 right now, one country can determine you know, the financial flows of the world. That's, that's completely uh, uh, outrageous. So there may be a, a second banking channel, uh, um, a, a, a non-dollar related, right? Uh, so the, North Korea can send money to Iran and Russia or whoever, Cuba, and there's a way to do that. And maybe the Chinese will sort of use their maybe as, as the backing, but I don't know. But these are some of the unintended consequences, I think. Kevin, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, um, I think that the head of the uh, central bank in England has floated some idea about uh, um, a, a whole new international banking system that's not uh, based on the U.S. government. It's, and a lot of these European countries are, are you know, upset because they want to do business with Iran. They like the Iran deal. They didn't want the U.S. government to uh, get rid of it. Um, and they can't, you know, transact with Iran. Um, and they, they're setting up this humanitarian channel called Instex, but you know, it remains to be seen if it's even going to work. Um, so it has people thinking about uh, creating a whole new system that isn't based on the U.S. dollar um, and uh, a development, you know, that's going to be forced by the U.S. basically abusing its privileged position. Um, but it's going to be uh, something that other countries uh, eventually want, if, especially if the U.S. government keeps doing this kind of stuff. So is there anything that we should add in closing? Uh, most of the questions I'm seeing have been answered in uh, throughout the last 50 minutes of your conversation. Is there, maybe we could talk about the things that U.S. citizens can do here here at home to uh, influence foreign policy. I know that's a lot of what um, Kevin and my work is, but Dr. Park, is there anything specifically that you would suggest to average citizens what they might be able to do to help change this situation? Right, so this is some, the, the kind of uh, the webinar is a great example of education because a lot of people may or may not know uh, the, the, the sort of the ins and outs of what's happening with sanctions and how US is, is, is really abusing its, its privilege. And, and then if they're, they're, they're concerned and they should speak out to their representatives uh, in Washington, saying you know, we, we need to put some pressure on uh, the executive branch. Um, and then there's you know, the other, other countries. Uh, the, the, group, the world is not just US. There are other countries in the world that are very concerned about what's happened. Uh, and, and, it, and how do we get them to come together and, and, and apply a new form of multilateral you know, accountability mechanism uh, that ensures innocent lives are not lost. I mean, this, this is absurd how even in a peacetime, we're not in war, the people, uh, innocent people are being killed. I mean, I hate to use that term, but it's, it's true. And no one's being held accountable. Well, no, it is a form of, uh, I, mean, I think I was in a conversation earlier this morning regarding Iran specifically that, you know, it is, their inability to effectively respond to the coronavirus because they cannot import the medicines and and um, and and equipment that they need, it is resulting in a form of it is killing. It is a it is a, a secondary form of of murder, and um, and that is what we really need our the U.S. population to understand. So, we, do either one? What would you suggest? Uh, are there any projects that our viewers could get involved in to help um, move things in a better direction? Any projects that you would suggest we, we take on? Even here at Code Pink, what would you like to see us do? Um, I would say that I think highlighting, uh, you know, the way sanctions work um, and how this is very specific to the U.S. and how this is a, a story about how the U.S. government has these privileges and how it uses them to essentially uh, 
uh, kill vulnerable people in poorer countries um, to achieve foreign policy goals. I mean, if, if that story can get more widely known, um, I don't think the average American really wants, you know, the U.S. government to be doing that sort of thing. Uh, it's not the U.S. The, the American people don't vote based on foreign policy necessarily, but um, you know it's very hard to justify something like this uh, to um, you know the people who it is being done in in their name. Um, so I, I think just getting that story out there um, would be very helpful. Uh, you talk about sanctions and. Um, uh, most people don't even realize this is a U.S. story. They think it's just how banks work, and it's not how banks work. It's how the U.S. government controls banks. So, so I have one more um, question before I let you both go, and I'm so thankful you've been able to give us an hour of your time. I really, really appreciate it. Um, we have a, a suggestion by a viewer. Let me read this. Um, the viewer is suggesting we push uh, the World Health Organization to come out against sanctions affecting coronavirus. Is that, does that make sense? And is that something that we as citizens and activists can take on? So I could tell you within the North Korea context, there is a UN resident coordinator who oversees all the UN agencies, including UNICEF and w World Health Organization. And he collects information from all these agencies on how the sanctions are impeding their work, and then reports back that reports that back to the UN Security Council. So that's the, that, that's the mechanism that, that that's that's set up. But I want, I want to take it a step further. Um, I mean, WHO is not a political organization. They really can't be because they're governed by the 190, you know, whatever 96 member uh, states, and so they they serve as a secretariat. So they can't really point out political issues uh, by themselves. But uh, um, this coronavirus situation. You, it's, it's, it's changed everything. It, it really highlighted that the threat that we're dealing with is really an external threat. You know, the traditional dynamic is, you know, the inter international security is adversarial, right? It's uh, us and them, and, you know, North Korea is a threat to us, and we, we have to apply sanctions. This global health security issue has, has made people think more about how do we cooperate and, and fight against an, an external threat. And it opens up an uh, interesting dialogue is, how do we cooperate internationally in a much better way? And sanctions just don't help in that dialogue. So, you know, I think this is a kind of an opening. We should take it and then and build on it. I completely agree with that. And one of the terms you used um, a few minutes ago, Dr. Park, was a multilateral solution. And I'm a big proponent of multilateral solutions versus the current unilateral paradigm we're working in. Um, so Kevin, any closing statements before I let you both go as we approach nine o'clock and I so thank all of you for staying with us this hour. Um, I, I think Americans can uh, ask uh, Congress and um, to repeal sanctions that uh, the Congress has passed. They can put pressure on Donald Trump to repeal them. This is a public health uh, disaster. So, uh, you know, there's a certain sort of uh, incentive for that in that regard, but also this is about uh, saving people's lives. And I think the average person can understand that stopping medicine or stopping masks or stopping ventilators from going into a country uh, right now, as well as in the future, but especially right now, doesn't make any sense. Well, it's a problem that's gonna come right back home and harm all of us. Mm -hmm. Our own foreign policy is going to come home and affect all of us. So anything else we should say before I let you both go? Anything that I have not? We've got a few questions that I will follow up with personally when offline because um, they're going to take some really in-depth um, research. So I appreciate some of, of what uh, some of the viewers have proposed. Um, anything else that we've not that we should say before I let everyone go. You asked about uh, some of the projects. So we are working on a, a, a couple of events at, at Harvard, um, uh, specifically looking at geopolitical determinants of health in North Korea. And one event will score to you know, look at the, the sanction situation very closely. So uh, I'm sure I'll be talking to you know, both of you. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, I hope so. That'll be a great follow-up webinar, great sure. follow-up conversation.
So I want to let our viewers know that on Wednesday at 12 p.m. Eastern, we Code Pink will be hosting a webinar on uh, on Iran specifically and how the healthcare crisis there with coronavirus. So you'll be able to watch that on Zoom or Code Pink's Facebook Live page. That's Wednesday, 12 p.m. Eastern. And I would also ask that you visit codepink.org for additional information on sanctions and both of our speakers tonight. And I so thank everyone for, for spending this past hour with us. Thank you, Dr. Park. Thank you, Kevin. And let's do this again. Your pleasure. Definitely. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.